Welcome to the Hold the Line podcast, and we are here at the NRSC headquarters in Washington, D.C., and I am joined by the amazing, incredible Senator Rick Scott from Florida. Thank you so much. I'm not so here. good that you moved to Florida yet. <laughs> I haven't moved to Florida. You know, every, almost you every could. other conservative <laughs> person I know has. Yeah, you, but you could. You mean, we have some homes for sale. Yeah. Somebody's got to hold it down in California, though. So Eventually it would change. Yeah. I'm optimistic. Me too. I, you know, I always, I, you know, look, it's real pretty simple. I always believe God has a plan. It would be easier if you just sent me a fax, tell me my list, <laughs> totally. what I'm supposed to do. Wouldn't that be easier? Yeah, a lot easier. <laughs> when you have to think about it. Yes, yeah, it's a lot easier. Well, I'd love to know, like, just a bit about your story. First of all, like, why did you get into politics and, you know, what makes you tick? Sure. I blame everything on my mom. Good. I think almost of all, all of us do. <laughs> um, I was blessed. I, I grew, I was born to a single mom. We lived in public housing in Illinois, cold, cold, cold Illinois. Uh, she said, thank God you live in this country. She said, you're going to go to church all the time. You're going to make straight A's. You're going to be an Eagle Scout. And she said, you should go get a job and you better never get fired. And that was, <laughs> I thought, mom, there's nobody like you. I told her that when I was growing up. I said, I, said, I don't know anybody in my school just like you, mom. And as I got older, of course, she'd be more appreciative of uh, right. what your parents are like. But she, I mean, I, I really believed what she said. Um, I believe that God has a plan, and this is the greatest country ever created, and it was divinely uh, created. And it's our job uh, to try to make sure we have the same opportunity for our kids and our grandkids. I got married at 19. Um, my wife clearly married me for my money. Um, I was making 156 bucks a month as an E2 <laughs> in the Navy. Um, so, you know, I've been, I've been blessed. I, I joined the Navy at 18, got married at 19. Um, we have a big celebration next year, a big wedding anniversary. Come on. We have two daughters and we have six grandsons and one granddaughter. And I got to build businesses and now I get to see if I can try to have a positive impact on the direction of the country. That your story is like it's like the American dream, man. It's like you started. I love that. I love. I love that you. So you, your dad wasn't really around. I never met my natural dad. My wife, my mom. I eventually remarried um, a bus driver, and um, he uh, he was a wonderful person. Never made any money, but he did all the combat jumps in the Second World War with the Eighty Second Airborne. He loved his service. He eventually was a truck driver. They. Um, you know, back, you know how truck drivers are so important now? Mm -hmm. When I was growing up, um, my adopted dad was laid off every Thanksgiving, every year. Wow. Because the, the totally difference was things were all in the department stores by Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. So they need truck drivers for about three or four months. So every year, my parents, I mean, they just struggled. I mean, they, my dad, of course, was not the best, you know, person with money, and uh, but good person. And so I just, you know, I think about it right now. My parents um, struggled to put food on the table. There were five kids eventually. And I remember we were talking about heating oil the other day. I remember as a kid, they would turn off the, uh, the, uh, the heat later in the day. And, you know, so first it's all good to bed early because it was freezing. I mean, Kansas City is not warm. Yeah. Illinois is not warm. And uh, the two places I grew up. And I just think that's what people are going through now. I mean, how yeah. crazy. I mean, they're, they, they don't have enough money for heating oil because prices have gone up or food. I mean, but no, I've been, I've, I mean, I'm blessed. I wouldn't, I'm, I married a wonderful person. I don't recommend getting married at 19, but it worked out for, got married for my at wife 22. and me. Did you really? Yeah. yeah. 22. It's great. I mean, I, I, my wife and I have grown up together. Yeah. And we've gone through a lot of experiences. She, um, when I told her I wanted to run for governor, uh, she said, that's great. She said, I don't ever want to give a speech because I'm scared to death of public speaking. <laughs> I said, I will never ask you. I didn't say other people might ask you. <laughs> <laughs> Three weeks into the campaign, I was in primary, so they're just so mean. Um, they asked her to uh, start giving talks, and so she did. My mom did. Uh, uh, my mom and my wife each did commercials uh, the, night of the night before the election. Uh, there was an article in the paper. We'd run so many commercials with my mom calling me a good boy. She said they called her a minor celebrity, and my mom wanted me to call the paper and say, no, she was a major celebrity. <laughs> it's hilarious. I've been blessed. Oh, wonderful man. mom, wonderful wife, great kids. So, and I mean, after, so you, 
you were crushing it in the business world and then you shifted to politics? Was that yeah, I, so I built, I built, I built the, um, I bought my first business when I was 22. Okay. I bought a donut shop so my mom could have a job. I was going to school full time and so was my wife and working full time. So we'd sort of all, we sort of were both, you know, trying to get our education done. And uh, then eventually I built uh, the largest hospital company in the country and then I did a lot of manufacturing companies. And in 2010, I shocked everybody and I announced I was running for governor in Florida. And um, I ran on a jobs platform. My opponent had every endorsement. So he ran on endorsements. I ran on, I'm going to get you a job. So I won the election and had a great time being the governor of Florida. It's a, it's a great job. And then I've been up here almost three years. This place is dysfunctional. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, by the way, when you say hold the line, we should do nothing. There's nothing good happening up here. I mean, there's nothing. I mean, it's just the most fascinating thing. There's the way the way the Senate works is whoever the majority leader controls all the votes. So I don't right. get a vote on anything. Right. I can force it based on time agreements and stuff. Right. But so Schumer controls all the votes. Right. So that's why I have this job as chairman of the NRSC to get a majority back. So I actually get to vote on something that I care about, not vote on stuff that I think is bad for the country. Wow. Like, do you, th you would not raise your kids to be dependent on government, right? Of course. Or dependent on yourself. You'd say, no, you got to go you know, be independent. You got to go figure this out. Mm -hmm. Up here, they want everybody to be dependent on government. Right. And you know they can't pay for it. Right. Right. <laughs> so, so as uh, one of the things I, I, I'm going to want to get into a few of the things that are happening right now across America, but I, I'm really fascinated at this. I was just on the border. I flew in from, well, I was in Iraq. Then I was in Texas on the border the last couple of days. Um, you know, Hispanic communities, the ranches, the farm stuff, and um, border patrol going crazy all over, bailouts happening, you know, immigration issues. Um, but what, I, what we're seeing right now, or at least what my experience is, is the Hispanics are moving largely to the right. There's that saying, you know, that the Dems have used um, demography is destiny. And you have been somebody that has been able to win the Hispanic vote, has been able to prove that. Why don't you talk a little bit about that and why you, where you see that going? Well, first off, we need to have border security. Right. And we all believe we have to have border security. Hispanics right. believe we have to have of border course. security. So what I did as governor is I, I went and talked to everybody. Now, right. Florida, we have a lot of Cubans, a lot of Venezuelans, right. a lot right. of Nicaraguans, a lot of Puerto Ricans. We have Brazilians. We have... You know, the whole, right. we have everybody. I mean, it's a great melting pot. Yes. Know, but we believe in legal immigration. Right. So I think the big thing is what you find is Hispanics are just like Republicans or as my Hispanic friends call me, tell me I'm more Hispanic. <laughs> and because what do they care about? They care about what you and I care about. Right. One, you like to be self-sufficient. Totally. Right. Number two, you're worried about your children's education because that's your future. Right. I mean, that's, that's what you think about. Right. And number three is you want to live in a safe neighborhood. Gosh, right. we all do. Right. So if we talk about those things, they vote with us. And so I've been able to to win the Hispanic vote, but it's not I don't really think of them as Hispanics. I think of them as fellow Floridians that care about the same issues I care about. Right. Of course. But I think it's interesting because that narrative is crumbling that they mm -hmm. are going to be the ones that secure the future of the Democratic Party and all that stuff. And we're seeing a shift in that. No, it's just the opposite. Do you see that continuing as we approach the midterms? If you look at the numbers, if you just want to do it from a number uh -huh. standpoint, is every four years, the percentage of the voting population that speaks Spanish is up 2%. Right. Okay. But the way I think about it is you should go out and try to tell people exactly what you're going to do right. and try to get everybody's vote. And, and, and because once you get elected, you represent everybody. Right. And so I think what Hispanics have figured out is that the Democrat Party is not good for their family. Right. Um, the Democrat Party is anti-religion, right? They're, uh, they're anti-family. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you just, you always look at, take their action, right? Mm -hmm. if, you, if you take the Democrats' action, they're against the things you and I believe in. Right. And, um, you know, the sanctity of life, right. uh, the importance of your faith, uh, the importance of, of being aspirational. The, 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 you know, Hispanics don't want people, like all of us, we don't want our kids to be dependent on government. Right. How's that helping your kid? And so, so and they're such incredible, diligent, hard workers. I mean, yeah. it's like they're here to live the dream. Right. 
Let me, as the way I look at it, they're here to live the same dream I had the opportunity to live. And what's important is everybody, and especially every kid and every grandkid, should have the same shot I had. The shot that, no guarantees, but it's a, it's an equal system. You right. can be anything you want to be. Mm-hmm. And um, so that's what I fight for every day. That's why I do this. I do this because I really believe in this country. I lived it. Yeah. Um, there's no place like it. Right. I mean, the easiest thing would be to move. Right. Right. That'd be easier. Um, like I try to get everybody to move to Florida. Uh, <laughs> the lower taxes and things like that, and better weather. But but the, that's the easiest thing to do is move. The harder thing yeah. is to try to fix it. So totally. that's what you're probably trying to do in yeah. California. Well, I think that, you know, uh, I I think where I differ from a lot of the conservatives, I mean, we, we've we been to 160 cities now across America hosting Let Us Worship gatherings. And really, some of our biggest gatherings are in the hardest cities like yeah. Seattle, Portland, Chicago, you know, the most, the bluest of the blue. Mm-hmm. Um, but the, a lot of times the rhetoric from conservatives is move to Florida, move to Texas, right. let's hole up, let's get ARs, let's get in our bunkers and wait it out. And I'm kind of like, well, that's a horrible strategy to change right. America. Yeah. So although, yes, I would love to pay <laughs> less taxes and I would love to be, you know, have a governor like DeSantis or whatever, and you know, not our, not the one we have in California. I do feel like this is a season to fight, and I yeah. think what we've seen in Virginia right. shows us what's possible. So, what I'd love to ask you is, you know, as chairman of the NRSC, I know you've encouraged people to engage in the culture war, right? And mm-hmm. we saw that happen in Virginia. We right. saw things shift. I lived in Virginia for ten years. So, oh, did you? Yeah. So, <laughs> I when I saw that, when I saw it go red, first of all, when the parents started standing up. And I was like, oh, it's over, yeah. right? And I think people underestimated the impact and the power of moms and dads. How do you see that becoming a blueprint for blue states or just even in general as we move forward? So you can go on the website, nrsc.org. Mm-hmm. You can give us money too, but, but on top of giving <laughs> us money, you can, you can look at um, our polls. We put out polls. Right. Uh, I think this we this is like seventy. Our, our Hispanic poll that we did nationwide Hispanic poll was in, like in May. I think it was seventy nine percent of Hispanics are fed up with the public school system. Yeah, we just did um, a suburban poll on the, in the battleground states at the end of September. Same thing. About eighty percent are fed up with the public school system, and they're fed up because I think the pandemic has allowed parents to see what their kids are being taught. Right, and they they saw that their their schools were not open because of the teachers right. union. And they're not anti-teachers. We're all pro-teacher, but we're, we're also pro that we get to be involved in our kids' education. Of course. And our schools ought to be open. Right. Right. And so I think, I think, I think, and here's the reason why we're going to have a good 22. Number one, Biden's policies are bad. Right. And people agree. Number two, Biden's popularity is crumbling because they see he's incompetent. Uh, number three, there's a lot of enthusiasm on our side. Uh, we've got good candidates. We've got the issues. But you know the other thing is, it's going to be all these school board races. Yeah, we're going to have parents all across this country, in red and blue states. They're going to get involved in school board races, and guess what? They're going to vote with us, because we're the party that believes that you should have an opportunity to participate in your kids' education. We don't believe the school should indoctrinate your kids. So I think the I think it's going to be fascinating how many school board races are there. It's going to be competitive school board races. People are going to really have to talk about what they believe now, um, and so it's going to help us win. I love that. I mean, I, 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 you know, being a father of four kids, and and I mean that's such a value I know in mm-hmm. our life and parents across America. And I think that it's your future seeing <laughs> yeah, and I think seeing what took place in Virginia gives people a lot of hope. You know, okay. that, oh, I'm very that, that, that we can move the needle. I would say my only, what I, I do feel like things are going to shift and I, I, I think it's very hopeful. What would be your encouragement to people that, okay, say we win back the, the house, win back the Senate, like we have the, the mojo and the juice. Well, last time that took place, there just wasn't enough accomplished. A lot of people feel like, what do you do with all that? Right. Then what? So he, the way I think about it is I'm very specific about what I run on. Mm-hmm. And I tell people, hold me accountable. So what you as a voter should do, you should, you should vet your candidates, make them answer the question about what they believe, and then bug the living daylights out of them to do what they said. 
it's no different than what you're doing if you're hiring a politician is right. you're hiring somebody. Right. You should manage them. Mm -hmm. You should you should you should spend a portion of your day thinking about good government. Right. And the people that you elect, whether it's your school board member, or your mayor, or your sheriff, or your governor, or your president, or your house and senate member, you should say, "Are you doing what you told me you were going to do?" Right. And let them know. You can send them an email. You can you know call them up. You can go to their office. They all have right. office. Like I have offices, nine offices around the state. I was very clear what I was going to do when I ran each of my races. What I was going to do. And I tell people, "This is what I plan on doing." Now, if you if you have some other goal. Right, maybe I'll do that, uh, but I told you what I was going to do. Right, and that's what and that's what we ought to do. It's our fault if we if we don't hold our elected officials accountable. It's our fault. Right, it's not their fault. It's our fault. Well, I I think, but what I feel like is what. Why do you feel like this time will be different? Like when, so, you know, when yeah. it, a host of issues, right? Everything from big tech to all these things that weren't addressed that could have been addressed. What I'm trying to get at is why should Americans yeah. be more hopeful in this season that something will change? Is it because the left has pushed things so far? Is it because there's an urgency? Is it? It's probably all the above. I think, I think clearly the left is pushing hard. They're trying to completely change this country, make it a socialist country. Right. I think that's one. I think number two is people are tired. People are tired of this and their, and their expectations are going up, which I think is right. good. So I think that the people that want to get reelected, they, they're going to have to do more. They're going to have to say, I'm not just going to fight hard. I'm going to actually right. fight so hard that I get something done. So I think, I think it's probably both. And I think the other thing is people are going to be, continue to be more vocal. I mean, you can see it in the Virginia race. Right. They were clearly more vocal. Those, you know, the parents showed up. Um, so I think that probably um, should make people feel like, you know, I've got to, I've got to get something done here. Yeah, that's I good. I hope so. I'm not yeah. sure. <laughs> the, uh, you got attacked recently <clears throat> by the CNN anchor who was trying to say kidding? critical I race theory. I guess, I guess. <laughs> I mean, I guess that's what happens with <laughs> senators. But said what he was saying that uh, CRT wasn't being taught in public schools. Yeah, right. And then... So they were at first they were denying it. Now they're defending it. Like what's happening there? Are they going to be so, able to get away with this? No. Okay. So, um, so number one is I hope the Democrats keep saying it's not true. You know, because parents are smart. Yeah. They see it. Right. They see it in their kids' textbooks. Yeah. They see it in the homework. They they see it in what their teachers say. You go to classroom right. sometimes you can see it. Right. So parents are smart. And so if the Democrats keep saying it, then what happens is nobody trusts them. Right. You know, in life, if, if you'd lied and somebody catches you, you know, they'll never trust, trust you again, right? Right. And so, uh, so the, that's number one. And then number three is look at, look at the, the um, look out there. Um, so what I did on that interview is I had a list. I, only, I just got through the first two of them. But I said, right now, you can get on the Virginia Department of Education website. And I said, this, this is where you should look. You can find it. I mean, it's pretty basic. I think it's incumbent upon us to call them out, right? And uh, and I think that you know, if if I'm gonna if I'm willing to um, to run for office and do this job, then I ought to call uh, people that are lying out for lying and right. say, no, this is a, this is reality, and I can defend it. And I'm gonna keep, I'm gonna keep doing. It. I think I think t teaching a child. Think about this: teaching a child that you won, you don't have a chance because of your skin color. I mean, how, I mean, would God ever want us to do that? Right. I don't think so. Or to teach a kid just because of your skin color, you know, you're an oppressor, or you're really mean to other people. Think about it. We, you know, you've got kids. That's not what you teach your kids. Of you teach your kids to accept everybody. And, right. and it doesn't matter what the color of your skin, you say, thank God you live in this country and you can be anything. Yeah. I mean, look at, the, look at what people of all different skin colors have had the opportunity to, to do in this country. Right. I mean, you've this clearly a land of opportunity. Totally. Yeah, totally. So I don't know why anybody would want to tell a child that your chances are less. Right. I would tell a child, you got every chance in the world. I used to do this when I was governor. I'd go to schools, and so I'd say, how many of you want to be governor? Okay. And so, you know, a few times, a few, I said, okay, here's the deal. You get to live in the governor's mansion. You get secret <laughs> service. You get to have dinner with the president. You meet kings and queens. You can have ice cream 24 hours a day. 
Because <laughs> my goal at the end was every kid said to themselves, you know what? That sounds Maybe pretty I good. should do that. And then I'd say, you know what? How many of you don't know your father? I didn't. How many lived in a poor neighborhood? I did. I said, so I said, I, if I can do it, you can do it. Because my goal was to one, create the, the hope. Yeah. And then create the save this. Say, well, if that guy can do it, he doesn't look much smarter than me. Yeah. <laughs> right? he, I should be able to do it. I'm going to do it. Yeah. Because that was my goal. I want every, I want every kid in Florida to say to themselves, I can, I, I know I can be anything. God, think about that. If you think about it, you're raising kids. Yeah. If every one of your kids believes they can be anything, you've you've succeeded. I've got I've got one of my grandsons that is going to be the first man on Mars, a paratrooper and a policeman. I've got another <laughs> one that's gonna <laughs> gonna play international soccer. He's gonna play with Messi and the European League. I got another one that wants to beat Bobby Fisher in chess. He's gonna be a grandmaster. And uh, the others are a little that. bit young for what they yeah. want to do yet. But, yeah, but I, that's what I mean. No ceilings, you know. I love no. that, and and I think I think that we we have to smash this victim mentality that's crushing yeah. the ability for people to achieve stuff. I love that, yeah. and that that's why I think your story is so powerful. Um, in closing, what 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 would be your encouragement? You know, we have a lot of people that that are believers across America. You know, they're people of faith. They've 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 been been through a lot in this season. Churches have been closed. You know, of course, now we're in this, you know, Biden era, which is like a full-on assault on like a lot of the First Amendment stuff. Uh, You know, got the vax managed. You got, I mean, a host of things. What is your encouragement to the church? Why is it important that the church is strong in this season? The church is optimistic, courageous? Yeah. Well, first of all, I think God has a plan. Yeah. It'd be nice if he just sent me my list, but (laughs) he's not going to do that. I think God has a plan. Uh, I really believe that um, that that it's incumbent upon each one of us to have faith, but then take action. And when I take action, everybody has to say what you want to be. Like my wife, she's probably not going to run for office, right? That's not what she wants to do. She doesn't want to take all take all the arrows. She really cares, but that's not what she wants to do. So, but get involved. Run for office. Support somebody. For sure, vote. Uh, help people raise money, help people get votes. I mean, be part of the process. Right. The other reason you should be part of the process is you'll learn a lot. You right. really do learn because you're forced to. Right. I mean, we're all, we all learn more by doing. So I'm, I'm actually very optimistic about, about the future. It's, it's, this place is pretty dysfunctional now, but I believe God will give us leaders that will bring us together. Um, you know, we, we need leaders that can figure out how to, deal with some pretty big issues right now yeah. and we will I, th- I think I think God will put people in the right place at the right time to uh, turn this country around and make it a country that we can all be proud of that are most importantly that our children and grandchildren have every shot the dream I love that and I I think that coming out of this COVID season you know it's like this awareness thing so many people didn't know their governor didn't know their senator didn't know anyone anything but then all of a sudden they're taking orders and having these <laughs> mandates from these people. And now it's like, oh, this is the person in charge I'm not that doing has this so much again. power, <laughs> you know, okay, he's put on notice. And so I love that. I think that there is an awareness, there is an awakening. I believe that, but it's my heart to see people engage, you know, yeah. and feel like they are, they have a voice. So I, I should tell everybody, I love my mom. I did not like being told what to do. And I don't think any of us do. And I don't believe that that's what God's purpose is. I don't think I don't think God put us here to be dependent on somebody else. I think God put us here to be independent and do good things. And so, and everybody's got their own purpose. Uh, and uh, and we should we should accept everybody's different purposes. And but all and to focus on a way. How do we just how do we make this the place where I, I there's no offense about 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 it that my kid and my grandkid and yours and everybody in this country actually can be whatever they want. Yeah. I mean, what a world. That's a hell of a world. That is. What a world. Well, thank you so much. Okay. Thanks for this joining me. Thanks for jumping on. Hope we can do it again. Yeah. We're going to be in Miami for New Year's, so we're going to go party in Florida and worship and pray, and it's going to be oh, great. You're going you're, you're gonna to have fun. And by the way, you'll have good weather too. Yes. That's going to be good. We'll, we'll be excited. Thanks for Thanks for having us. We'll be praying for you. And uh, God bless America. God bless. God bless bless this great country.